welcome everyone to episode 59 of Today in the Scene. I'm Joe with Indie Arcade Wave, and I just want to say thank you to everybody that's checking us out, anybody that's subscribing or sharing. We appreciate it. It means a lot to us. So this week, we have the pleasure of speaking with the founder of Polycade, Tyler Bushnell. Polycade is a multi-cab, main cab, gaming PC, all in one home arcade. It's kind of a whole bunch of different things, and we'll have Tyler kind of explain what exactly it is. Um, but I guess without further ado, here's Tyler. How are you doing? Hey, Joe. How's it going? Good, good. I'm glad we could get you on here. I know we met a few years ago in Vegas at, uh, what was that, AMMO or something like uh, that? A the AMOA. Yeah, that one, that one. Um, uh, Amer American amusement. or Amusement Machine Operators of America. Yes, that one. <laughs> um, so that was cool to see Polycade for the first time. Um, that was, from my understanding, a pretty early build. So there is a, quite a bit that has changed since then. Um, and I know when we were talking then you were kind of limited on what you were going to put on the machine. And now it seems like you've opened it up to so many different things. Um, I guess I'll just kind of start asking you questions to get a little bit more information about that. Um, before we jump in though, if you are watching the videos here and you like what we're doing in New Arcade Wave, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. It helps us a ton. Uh, let your friends know, and we will just keep the videos coming every week. So let's jump in. Tyler, just tell us about yourself. Introduce yourself. Let us know who you are um, for anybody that doesn't know who you are. Yeah, definitely. Um, I uh, So I grew up sort of in the arcade and video game industry. My dad's uh, Nolan Bushnell, uh, created uh, Atari and Chuck E. Cheese. Um, and so uh, that, you know, I think perhaps helped define who uh, I have become. <laughs> um, uh, but... Um, yeah, I'm a software engineer originally by trade um, and love building all kinds of things. Um, got started with Polycade about uh, five years ago um, as uh, for a variety of reasons. We can get, get, get into that later. Um, but uh, yeah, it's been a fantastic project and, um, and really excited for our next phase as well. Yeah, I guess to kind of build off what you just said there, that there's a lot that's gone into Polycade and everything, but what is Polycade? Like, let the people know that are listening what Polycade is, because even to me, I've seen it as three or four different products kind of growing through time. Um, where is Polycade now? Yeah, uh, so Polycade is the platform for in-person play. Uh, our software powers uh, PC-based consoles and arcade machines, uh, including our commercial grade uh, two and four player machines. Uh, so all of our features are designed to support this type of in-person and location-based gaming. Uh, features like small pond leaderboards, location-based achievements, uh, and enabling players to access their game library from any Polycade install. Uh, so for example, uh, if you own Broforce and Speedrunners on the Polycade platform, and you sign in to a Polycade at a bar uh, or your friend's house, uh, those games will show up and be playable for you. Um, and signing in super fast, you just scan a QR code on the screen. Um, now, because social, these type of social venues and in-person environments uh, typically have some kind of communities around them, uh, our future features are all designed to uh, support those communities and uh, help build them. Uh, th so things like meetups and tournaments uh, and other digital connectedness like uh, live streaming. So with the Polycade, I understand like the idea of what you're trying to do with it. What if someone were to buy a Polycade, right, and put it in their arcade or in their um, whatever their their rec room for their apartment building or their office building? What would they expect with getting the Polycade? Like, what do they get with it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Um, so it, for for your commercial free play environment, um, we can operate the machine in a couple different ways. You can buy the games yourself and then, you know, sort of have those games available for your customers or employees. Um, or we can operate the games ourselves. Uh, uh, we can operate the games for you. And so uh, those would be running, run, we would be running the games on a rotating cycle. Uh, so always keeping the content fresh. Um, and, you know, even if it's retro, <laughs> it's still uh, having those, that cycling uh, game pattern uh, helps keep your your players engaged, right? Uh, one problem with classic arcade machines is they only play one game. Uh, they're big and heavy and difficult to move. So, um, you know, at the the sort of very most basic um, Polycade 
machines are remotely updatable um, and uh, also include other fun features like, um, you know, screensavers. We can do a lot of like pixel animation art for screensavers. Uh, and coming soon, we've got uh, leaderboards that will be shared, um, you know, with your friends and, and the, the particular venue that you're playing in. Uh, but you could also see your leaderboards on like a, a state level and a national level. Yeah, that's cool. I like the the idea of the the leaderboards. Like, I mean, like you said, the single player games inherently bring up conversation and kind of camaraderie between players because you find out someone's better than you, you want to find out why they're better than you, so you have to talk to them and get better than them. Um, I guess uh, the next question I have for you is, how did Polycade come to be? Like, kind of tell us the story of how you came up with the project and who you brought into the project and where it's gone from the beginning to now. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so the the project came out of uh, a couple, uh, the inception uh, was for a couple different reasons. Um, you know, video games today have really, uh, the, the video game industry has really focused on uh, two sides of gaming. Uh, one is um, hyper casual, and this is like your mobile, mobile typically dominated by mobile. Um, and then uh, your really hardcore sector, which uh, happens on consoles as well as PCs. Um, but the the and and something that hasn't gotten a lot of attention in the video game space in a very long time maybe decades uh is mid-core gaming um and this is sort of you know a lot of the games of the 80s and 90s are are actually really behave like mid-core games um they're easy to learn they're uh they have relatively short play cycles they're difficult to master um and they they're not super punishing right um, and so people who, for example, don't have a lot of time on their hands can still, you know, drop in, engage real quick, have fun. Um, and, you know, they're not committed. Right. Um, and so you, you constantly hear about people who, uh, you know, I love video games, but like, I just don't have time for them anymore. Uh, I've got a family and like this other thing. Right. Uh, and, and that, that really comes from a place of, uh, you know, video games are typically, designed for private experiences. You're not really supposed to, uh, the, the gaming industry today is, focuses on that private experience where, uh, you know, you're typically alone, even if you're playing online with friends um, and uh, don't tip, they don't typically lend themselves well to uh, playing together with the people around you, right? Um, and part of the reason for that is, uh, is, is high learning curves, right? Where, um, mid-core games are much easier for multiple people to sort of get behind and enjoy. Uh, so recognizing a couple things in uh, the video game space that were missing, it was, you know, a focus on mid-core games and a, an accessible platform, right? Uh, a platform that uh, is sort of in the middle of your social space is uh, easy to have fun with your friends when they're over. Um, you know, if you meet them out for a drink at the bar, uh, this should also be a, a great time to, to engage um, and have a quick game and, and sort of facilitate interactions. Um, and then uh, secondly, um, that so mid-core gaming and, and gaming in social spaces, like a platform that's made for that, right? Um, if you've ever worked at like a company that decided it was going to buy an Xbox or a PlayStation so that, you know, employees could have fun playing video games from time to time. In my experience, uh, those Xbox and PlayStations basically never get touched because um, the sort of uh, play cycles are too long, right? Uh, you don't want to sort of sit down on the couch, boot the thing up and like sit there for an hour at work. That's not how that, you know, that doesn't look good. <laughs> um, whereas something like an arcade machine is very approachable. Um, and even uh, would help uh, create relationships in, in your office. And um, interestingly, there's a, a recent article that came out that uh, says that um, playing video games with your, your coworkers will uh, it can increase productivity by 20% at work. It's science. I mean, I guess that, that, that doesn't sound that crazy. I mean, you get to be with those people and chat with those people and you don't have to have barriers up. You know, you can just let back and have a good time. 
Yeah, exactly. You know, it's something that that was also kind of very meaningful for for me uh, was uh, my dad has had hundreds of people come up to him over the years uh, and tell him that they met their significant other playing Pong. Um, and so, you know, for, for the listeners that aren't intimately familiar, Pong is a two player only game. You can't play one player. Um, it was typically placed in bars. Uh, and, and what sort of happened, uh, was it became like a very, like, you know, low non-threatening icebreaker, uh, to ask someone to, to, Hey, you want to play a game of Pong with me? Um, and now you get a chance to sort of, you know, be focused on something while getting to know somebody. Yeah, I, I mean, it makes perfect sense. I can totally understand how that happened. Um, so walk me through Polycade. Like the, so when I saw it in 2018, um, and it was kind of displayed as you have a handful of indie games that are licensed on the platform, to now where it's blown up to the point where you can run Steam on it. You can, I mean, you can play Street Fighter V. I mean, you do all these different things. Kind of tell me a little bit more about how you guys moved in that direction of making it kind of, I mean, kind of like a main cabinet, but it, it does so many other things. It's like a gaming PC at the same time. Yeah, you, you bring up something else, Joe, that um, that was one of the uh, one of the things that made me think that there was you know something missing from gaming, which was um, a lot of the mid core games that you have coming out in the last fifteen years. Um, they most people haven't haven't really reached those. Most people haven't played them, right? Um, because so many people that love video games, but they're not hardcore gamers have kind of opted out of gaming completely. I actually even did this and I'm, I'm like a pretty dedicated gamer, but, um, in my mid twenties, I decided that, uh, I was playing red dead redemption and I like play it, pick booted it up for the first time I play. I was like, uh, you know, it goes through all the tutorial stuff. I played for like two hours one night. I was like, oh, this game is amazing. Look at all this detail and like, et cetera, all these things I could do. And, you know, that full-time job and um, didn't really get a chance to play for a couple weeks. And when I came back and, and booted it up again, I, I was, I, I'd like forgotten all the controls. Completely overwhelmed with how much there is to do. You will not even that I like couldn't play. <laughs> I and like you know I I tried to like Google like control maps and stuff and and like nothing came up. So I kind of was like eh, I don't want to go through the like the starting part again. And and they always know, run like an hour long tutorial. Like yeah, it was uh, two hours basically. And like I I was kind of like ah you know what. I guess like these kind of games are not for me anymore. Um, I just don't have the time and, and, and frankly, I don't have the patience. Um, so, uh, coming back to mid core gaming, you have, you know, this, this, and it's typically indie indie devs that are building mid core games that are sort of made in the vein of games in the eighties and nineties. Right. Um, games like, you know, Tricky Towers, Broforce, Galactic Battleground, right? Like all these titles um, are sort of lost in the shuffle of, uh, and and that's that's not fully true. You know, obviously, if you're a gamer, you've probably heard of these games and and know them well. But uh, for the rest of the population that has sort of like decided that the Xboxes and Playstations aren't for them, uh, and like that means they're definitely not a PC gamer, probably uh you know it, it, this stuff's hard to find and and um there's a missing curation out in the world uh and so that was a, a big driver for us and and by extension you know uh discoverability for games can be very difficult um where you know we envision a world where polycades are all over the place and you can kind of easily sample uh these games that you've never seen before um and so for those of you that you know think that you're too old for games or, or you're not a gamer anymore i'll prove you wrong <laughs> yeah i mean you make a really good point with like the mid the mid-tier gamers where it's like you don't have a ton of time but you also want to play something that's a little more challenging than like a mobile game where it's just tap 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 um, totally and and add in like the you know the family element right usually you you don't have time because you've got like a wife and kids right. or something and 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 you know there's people that that need your time and want to spend time with you and and the, 
playing video games together is a fantastic way to do that. Yeah, and indie, indies give you such a, a good avenue with that because you can get such a simple game where there's only a couple controls. It only takes five minutes to figure out how to play. Anybody can play. Totally, exactly. But there can still be that like sort of depth and um, you know nuance, right? Through the, like the story and the art, and they can t they can get you a different way where like playing is easy, but there's so much more to discover. Yeah, exactly. I love and and something that's happened in recent days is this sort of um, concept of like games that sort of build on themselves. Uh, Dead Cells does this really yep. well, where you know the first time you play Dead Cells. It's kind of simple. You're like, okay, jump and attack. I got this. Uh, and then as you play more, you're like, oh, wait, this roll is really key. And and then you start unlocking more weapons. And so it, it's sort of like, you know, very gradually increases in complexity in a very, like, uh, approachable way. That's not, right. you know, that doesn't overwhelm you even if you... Uh, drop it and come back you know, right it, it doesn't later. throw a two-hour tutorial at you it's like that's right. these, hit these three buttons and then in 15 minutes we'll show you one more button yeah exactly right <laughs> yeah and then the, the the trigger is a shift button which changes all the buttons <laughs> <laughs> you got three different shift buttons on the controller the, yeah triple a games are, are are a lot sometimes if you don't have like a full like three four days to sit down and block out four or five hours a day like it's going to be hard to like build any kind of muscle memory for that game. Totally. Um, I guess tying back into what we said kind of early on, um, your dad, he's a pretty, pretty big name in the, the video game industry for anybody that doesn't know him. Um, he kind of found Atari, right? That's pretty, pretty important for video games. Um, since he was in the industry for so long, um, how did he influence you growing up? Like, was that a big industry or like a, a big influence for you moving in and like, you got older and you were like, this is what I want to do because like my dad did it or did it go a little bit different than that? No. Yeah. You know, um, video games, I took to video games really early on. I mean, I, I guess, you know, all my friends did too. Like we were all that it, we were like, ironically, I didn't ever really play Atari. Um, don't, yeah. <laughs> my, my, uh, my parents just never really put it in front of us. Um, and so when the NES came out, it like we were just all about that um and you know my whole friend group and everything and so uh we took to that early on and like i fell in love and and never looked back um you know i'm sure the fact that like my dad's legacy probably influenced that but growing up you know i mean nolan bushnell is not a household name for most uh people and so um you know it's not like kanye west or something <laughs> so like right. You know, it was it was kind of like uh, because all the Atari and Chuck E. Cheese stuff was gone by the time I was uh, aware of the world. Um, it all felt, you know, kind of like a like a legacy and like a, a history thing. Um, and, you know, but he wasn't really involved in the video game industry at that time. Um, so, uh, you know, that being said, he'd make like the occasional business trip to Japan and bring back like at that time, you know, all the cool stuff was coming from Japan and like they got everything first. Uh, and so every so often we'd get some cool stuff coming back from Japan. We got a Famicom at one point and it was like, uh, so that was fun. So, you know, I'm sure that that influenced my, my love of video games. Yeah. Getting the, getting the exclusives and, uh, I mean, what, which one was it? Was it the second Mario brothers where they released a different version in the U S cause it was too hard. Oh, Something, really? I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. So oh, there's, cool. there's two separate versions. And then they later released, I think it was called like the lost levels. It was like a third version in the U S and it was all the levels that they had in the Japanese version. Right. Um, but they basically dumbed it down for the U S gamers. Cause we weren't as. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Worth mentioning by the way, also that, um, you know, we, uh, my dad's always been very like sort of hands-on loves to teach us stuff. Um, and so he would take us to trade shows since like the time we could walk. Um, and you know, back in the eighties going to the AMOA was like, so cool. That's like IAPA these days, I'm assuming. Or yeah, actually it was maybe, well, I guess we went to both. We went to IAPA sometimes and AMOA sometimes, uh, and then E3, uh, as well. And so, um, as a kid running around to like all the latest games, um, you know, which usually took a couple years to release, uh, was and, and all on free play, right? It was like a, the biggest arcade ever on free play. It was awesome. 
uh, add in like crane machines with tons of candy and you're like this is way better than Halloween. paradise yeah <laughs> yeah kid paradise 100 percent um i guess looking back you kind of mentioned a little bit with like the stuff you got into when you were really young um i find this is always a really hard question to ask people because it's there's so many different things that um alter your opinion on this but if you could rank them we'll just say video games ever like your top five most either most memorable or favorite video games of all time so uh thank you for saying five because most people say what's your favorite game and i'm like that doesn't work that way That's true. You, can't, you can't pick one everything's got a different part of your it, that tugs at your heart like precisely well said yeah um so my first love was legend of zelda um still remember going to toys r us and walking out with that golden cartridge very memorable. oh toys r us yeah yeah that's uh, a good one <laughs> and then uh but you know so toys r us is up or <laughs> toys r us, Legend of Zelda <laughs> is up there um terraria I, I, if, which i still don't know if that's i say that right but that is probably arguably my favorite game of all time um let's see what else um i'm now blanking out um there's so many more uh it's you know hard. some Ironically, it's some games that I spent a lot of time in. I wouldn't put in my favorites. Um, like, I did my tenure in well, tenure. I did a did my time in World of Warcraft. Uh, did that for a, a while. Yep. Yeah, played a ton of um, Warcraft three as well. Um, Warcraft three is a great, fantastic game. Um, but uh, yeah, yo, oh, Limbo. I, I can't. You know, Limbo is one of my favorite games of all time as well. Um, just. I feel like Limbo is where the threshold, I mean, video game art is now definitely like a thing. Um, but uh, there was a time when it was like, you know, can like actual art or like traditional art sort of be in integrated into video games. And, and, it, you know, there was some uncertainty there. I thought uh, Limbo totally did that. And it was like, the whole experience of that game just like broke my brain when I when I the first time I played it through. I feel like that game came out at the perfect time too because everybody was so focused. All the studios that were making games were like realism, realism, realism. Like they're going for hyper realism and it's getting better with every single console. And then Limbo comes out and they're like, let's just make a game like in black and white. Yeah. And like tell a great story and have just like not even that the art was like beautiful but it was just like all silhouettes and it was it was so such a unique experience to play a game like that and yeah. indies do it better than triple a's i think by that means like they're telling story through the art right right and 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 then the art was like integrated into the mechanics of the game as well which was like really i felt like such an elegant touch um i'm actually so i'm dying to make a um custom limbo cabinet um and I've got like a whole design that I think you'll appreciate. Um, like, for example, I want the, uh, I want every time you die, uh, I want, so the cabinet will just be, will will have sort of like a hole that you put your hands in uh, for the joystick and buttons. And then every time you die, uh, there will be like AC on your hands and uh, you'll, like the ac will crank up every time you die the cold touch of death yeah 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 that uh, sounds awesome. <laughs> uh so if you if you know um uh i forget his name um if you know him i would love to chat with the limbo founder yeah me too i mean i i definitely feel like reaching out that'd be cool art jensen yeah uh so anyone that gets in touch with art jensen please tell him i'd love to chat with him <laughs> um well i guess that that kind of covers everything i wanted to talk to you about um i guess let people know where they can get a polycade how much polycade is and any other social medias that you want to shout out right now yeah um so worth mentioning you know like polycade we are we're building our software for the most part the hardware product uh you can get on our our website um and the software you can download from our website as well. Uh, our software runs on any Windows PC. 
you can play it with a an regular Xbox controller. We also have these um, uh, 8 bit uh white label controllers, uh, Polykid branded controllers available on the website. Uh, those were just uh, about to ship the first ones. Um, but so, uh, yeah, if you, for example, want to build your own arcade machine, um, you can install our software on, on your own uh, device as well. Um, so uh, Polycade experience on the software side, or if you want the full experience, um, uh, the, the arcade machines are available on our website as well. Awesome. Um, well, I'm going to throw your guys' social media links. I know you guys are on, what, like Instagram, Twitter, you've got your website. I think you have a Facebook page. I, I'm pretty sure I follow the Facebook page. We do have a Facebook page, but we're not the best yeah, about Facebook. I, um, I'm getting the same way. I'm pretty inactive on Facebook. Um, yeah, we're, we're still a small team. So if you want to get in touch with us on social media, I would recommend Instagram. We watch that one. Yeah, that's how I got in touch with you. It took about <laughs> 20, 20 minutes. You guys got back to me. Um, but yeah, I just want to say thanks, Tyler, for coming on here and letting us know a little bit about Polycade. Um, and to everybody that's still watching, I appreciate you checking out the episode. If you like what we're doing here, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Um, and we'll be back next week with another one. Peace.